Facts Ahead, brought to you by the Model Railroad Industry Association, helping hobbyists design and build their own miniature railroad empires, inside or outside, big or small. Cotto, manufacturer of precision railroad models and the Unitrack system. Markland Trains, a manufacturer of both European and American electric trains. Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit a layout that proves you don't have to have a lot of room to make a great model railroad. We'll stop at a Wisconsin city that has revived the good old days of electric streetcars, and we'll explore the wine growing region of southern Australia, by train of course. Now these days you can pick up fresh fruit or juice almost anywhere, but it wasn't all that long ago when a fresh orange or a grapefruit was a rare treat. That all changed when a newfangled train came rolling down the tracks. This is the Tropicana Juice Train, loaded with orange juice. It's headed for stores in your neighborhood, straight from Florida. If you've ever had the opportunity to see the train go by, it's an awesome sight. You know, the train at some point in time can be up to a mile long in total, and it's a stream of orange cars with Tropicana written on the side of it. So that sight in itself is pretty exciting, no matter if it's going out the door or it's coming in your door. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The story really starts at the Tropicana plant in Bradenton, Florida, where the oranges take the first step in their long but swift journey to your glass. First thing you should know is that the fruit is harvested you know, from the months of October through June every year. And they come in in raw form as an orange itself in uh, trailer loads. These trailer loads are then picked up, uh, put into our sorting and cleaning operation on a daily basis, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. And they go through a process of being able to be sorted into different sizes. And as a result of being put into different sizes, then they're put into the operation of actually being cut in half and reamed or extracting the juice from that standpoint. The product is packaged in many different varieties. We have approximately 300 to 350 SKUs or shipping units that we have. Uh, they're all palletized and then from a palletization process they move into our warehousing operation. Now, in the warehousing operation we have two courses to move the product out the door. We put it in trucks going directly to some of our customers in the southeast area here in the United States from Florida or on our train and our train takes the product directly to our New Jersey facility and our Cincinnati facility. Since CSX and Tropicana have been doing business for almost 30 years together, it's really maybe the last two years that we became partners in this relationship and really trying to find ways to help each other to move forward, to trying to find ways to make sure that the cars are safe, to try to find ways to increase the speed and cut down on the cycle time it takes to move the cars from Jersey City back here and also from here up to Cincinnati and that whole network of moving the cars. Uh, we own and operate 353 cars right now and we turn those cars approximately three times a month. Without the help of CSX and, and the cooperation of the Tropicana employees, turning them at that rate would never happen. Uh, to my knowledge, that's about three times the industry average. When you look at this juice train, you should also think of the Pacific Fruit Express. If not for the PFE, the juice train would never have been born. Pacific Fruit Express was one of a number of transcontinental perishable handling organizations founded by E.A. Chairman at the time when SP and UP were one. And it was really to provide a transcontinental shipment of perishables to the East Coast where everybody lived in the early part of the century, 20th century. This train is a long-time East Coast fixture between Florida and New Jersey. Historian Anthony Thompson wrote a book called Pacific Fruit Express about the train that was a regular fixture on the West Coast. He says it was more than just another train. It was a big deal. I was struck in doing the research that oranges were Christmas presents in the early part of the 20th century. And when you got pears in the market or peaches or anything like that, it was for just a few weeks and that was all there would be. And people were accustomed to that, but it meant that both fruits and vegetables that we take for granted practically year-round today just weren't available in, in those days. Part of it's transportation and part of it is storage and broader crop seasons and those aspects as well. The Pacific Fruit Express train brought folks what was then rare produce. 
The train is still by far the best way to move the juice, much better than trucks. And you know how you see some trains sort of poking along, rocking their way to some distant destination? Not the juice train. It really hammers along the route. The best way to look at the, the railroad advantage that we have is that it brings speed into our system. And in reality, speed and volume together. And that's a unique thing for us. We have such a high consumption of orange juice in our northeast and now into our Midwest area that to put the volume of trucks on the road to accomplish that would be just monumental. And what the train brings to us is a two-day delivery or cycle time into the northeast and the Midwest. And additionally, you know, a huge amount of volume moving at one point in time. Each railroad car equates to about three and a half truckloads of product. So do the math. If we're shipping 50 to 60 carloads, you can imagine how many additional truckloads that would have to be. And since we're talking numbers, how about the fact that this Tropicana plant covers 268 acres? 68 of those acres are under one roof with 3,200 people at this facility. More numbers? How about a fleet of more than 300 refrigerated boxcars? How about two trains, one with 45 cars that make six trips a week between Florida and New Jersey, and another train called the Midwest Juice Train with 30 cars making two trips between Florida and Cincinnati? And if that isn't enough, the Tropicana plant uses four million oranges a day. That equates to approximately 400 truckloads of product a day coming into our facility and being processed. And then on the outbound side, we're looking at maybe 200 truckloads of finished product going out the door, along with another 45 to 50 railroad cars of product. And the train brings a neat thing to us. It's, it's a concept because you know, people get excited about seeing a train go by. You know, sometimes when you have to wait for the train to go by, you're not so excited. Uh, but the other side is that it is a, a major monumental feat on a daily basis to pull anywhere from 45 to 70 cars out of this lot and do that anywhere from six to seven times a week. And just think, it's all because people love their orange juice. And you're waiting for something really good. I mean, the fact of the matter is that in the New York metro market, we're the number one selling item in the grocery store. So when that train arrives, every grocery train is looking forward to that shipment. So next time you grab a carton of juice, remember the juice train. If you think about it, it's carrying more than just juice. It's carrying tradition and history. Think back to the old days when juice was cooled with ice on the trains of the PFE. Well, I think the, the key in, in a fleet like Pacific Fruit Express was that refrigerator cars were specialized and expensive, and most railroads didn't want to buy them because for that four to six week peach season, you didn't want to own cars that sat around the rest of the year. But Southern Pacific and Union Pacific, with their huge territory, with such different climates and different parts of it, could keep the cars busy most of the year. You know, you had potatoes late in the fall, and pretty soon you have oranges in California in the winter, and, and so on throughout the whole crop year. So they could make use of a large fleet, and they had the largest in the country, in a way that individual smaller railroads could, could never have done. And ice was used uh, until a surprisingly late uh, time, 1972 is when it was discontinued. And the real reason for that is ice is cheap and it's very effective because when ice melts, it really absorbs a lot of heat. It really took a lot of heat out of the produce. So you could even put warm produce from the field into the cars and that melting ice would very rapidly suck up the heat. And that really was something you could not do with mechanical refrigeration for a long time. In fact, today you, you can't do it. Air doesn't have the same kind of ability to remove the heat. But today shippers will cool the produce out of the field before they put it into the shipment cars or trucks as they often are today. Those old images are just an older version of these. The thing they have in common is trains. So the next time you grab some orange juice, think of where it came from, how it got there, and how in your own small way you're playing a part in history, the history of the juice train. The next time you sit down for a cold glass of orange juice, think about the speed with which it got to your table. It's a speed that was made possible by the railroads. Sometimes when you look at impressive layouts, it's the sheer size that knocks you off your feet and makes you go, wow. But you don't have to have a giant layout to have a nice one. We found a guy in California who shows us that great things really can come in small packages.
The Lumber Company railroads of the Sierra Nevada were tough workhorses, just like the men who earned a living there. Narrow gauge logging railroads that rolled through the foothills of the Sierra, not far from Yosemite National Park. They brought the men in and the logs out round the clock during logging season. One of the best was the West Side Lumber Company. Its 72 miles of track and the years of history are accurately replicated in a small 10 foot by 10 foot layout in the San Jose, California home of Steve Anderson. He models the late 1950s. I chose the West Side because it allows me to model uh, two favorite things, the high Sierras with all the tall trees and the mostly geared locomotives that the West Side ran. Steve's layout is not the giant basement layout he once dreamed about. It's just a small layout in an upstairs bedroom in his house. It's the narrow gauge that allows Steve to put so much into such a little space. Narrow gauge is just a medium. Uh, it's no different than modeling standard gauge except that the railroad I am interested in happened to be narrow gauge. Uh, SN3 is a scale I settled on after experimenting with HON3 and ON3. HON3 being difficult to run reliably and ON3 being so large that you need a basement to get anything done. Logging railroads are interesting to model. The equipment is different because it was mostly home built and the locomotives all have a certain character to them. It's not a big time operation so you don't need acres of real estate to model it effectively. Steve's not just a modeler, he's a craftsman. It's such a realistic looking layout because Steve Anderson did such a great job putting it together. He built it in small sections. Each one is electrically independent so it's unpluggable and movable. Most of the structures are scratch built. The buildings with interiors are built board by board with complete framing, including studs and rafters. On the other buildings, scale lumber was simply glued to the sheet styrene, which was used for the roof and the walls. Those are beautiful brass models of the geared Shea and Heisler engines that the west side used. You'll notice that the rolling stock is only lightly weathered Steve says that's accurate as well, because on the prototypes, the equipment was well maintained. Logging railroads existed off of moving timber out of the woods, and light weathering is essential. Uh, basically, the winter months, when the snow was deep in the woods, prevented you from bringing the timber out. This is especially true later in the logging uh, years, as everything was done by trucks. And not only would you have to wait for the snow to melt for the railroad, but you'd also have to wait for the dirt to dry for the diesel trucks to drive through it. During these months of inoperation, the railroad rebuilt much of their equipment. Most of their equipment was wood, and they basically would burn the car, salvage the metal parts, and then put them onto new timber. As far as the scenery is concerned, the technique is fairly simple. Blue extruded foam is the base for hydrocal. Commercial rock castings were not stained, but instead painted with artist acrylic paints. And if some of the ground cover looks like the real thing, that's because it is. Several visits for logging conventions and train rides placed me within close proximity of the west side, so I just gathered up dirt and decided to experiment with it. It's very easy to work with and it captures the color perfectly. So, if you ever thought you needed a giant house and a lot of space in order to build a first-class layout, think again. Steve Anderson is proof positive that bigger is not always better. One thing we should mention is that Steve worked at Talbot's train store for more than a decade. Those years of experience gave him a good insider's knowledge of what works best on a small home layout. Oftentimes we find ourselves longing for the good old days. For many of us who are rail fans, the good old days were the times when electric streetcars rolled down the main streets of America. Well, in one Wisconsin city, the good old days just rolled back into town. First though, you all know that wine is a special passion of mine. One of the great wine producing regions in the world is the Barossa Valley in southern Australia. And appropriately enough, you can get there by rail. 
Australia's Barossa Valley is synonymous with wine. Some of the finest vintages from down under come from these old vines. This lush, rolling countryside provides just the right mix of sun, soil, and rain. It's just outside of Adelaide in South Australia, and, fortunately, a train runs through it. Inside, it's not just a view of passing scenery. It's a chance to sample some of the best this region has to offer. Cheers. We like wine, and we're doing a tour of Australia, and we thought it would be a nice thing to do. It's the whole experience. It's traveling in a group. Uh, it's getting to all the different wineries. We go to small boutique wineries, which some people don't necessarily know about. Uh, it's the commentary of the area. It's the information we provide uh, and the service. The wine flows freely from the moment this train heads out from the station in Adelaide. There's a wide selection of reds and whites from which to choose. In fact, it seems some passengers sort of forget there's something to see outside the glass. We haven't really looked out the window much. We've been enjoying a cup of tea and the chat. We're interested in Australian wines anyway, so I mean we get a lot of them exported obviously back home. Um, just to really taste some new wines that we don't obviously get back home really and uh, you know, see if we can bring some back with us perhaps. A big draw for this trip is the train itself. It's made up of old coaches updated for a more comfortable hour and a half ride out to the Barossa Valley. More and more often, travelers are turning to the rails when setting out on a journey, especially when it's on vacation. John just loves trains, so... <laughs> yeah, we... Yeah, I do. I love trains. As a matter of fact, we came over from Sydney on a train. And we came over on the Garn and had a day at uh, Brogan Hill and then on the Indian Pacific. And when I set a wine train, well, I was on that too. <laughs> train travel in Australia has been very popular over a number of years, uh, so people love trains uh, and love the whole stigma that goes with it. The Barossa Wine Train brings twin passions for trains and wines together in one thoughtfully designed excursion. We take them around and we visit three or four major wineries, we give people a guided vineyard tour, we do a structured wine tasting. So what you're looking at now, a very lightly oak Chardonnay, the 1999 Chateau Cadet. Um, spent three months in oak, nice fruit weight, so you'll feel it when you, it's, it's on, your, on your tongue, lingers on the palate, finishes dry, but just with a hint of oak. Okay, so have a look at that one. There are more than 80 wineries here in the Barossa Valley. Back in the old days, it was an area serviced by old steam trains. The rails in this area are well-traveled. It's an area steeped in the tradition of fine winemaking. So these vines here are what our owners like to refer to as a piece of agricultural history. They're all over 150 years old. They're the oldest vines in the Barossa. Um, they've never been watered in their lives. Uh, in fact, we'd probably be wasting water if we were to water them. That's because the roots are so long and thick that they can survive on groundwater far below. The result is a fine quality grape that stuns palates across the globe. Now the fruit is um, very small and it does have quite a low yield, but it's extremely flavorsome. Uh, in fact, our winemaker says it's the most balanced wine he's ever worked with. Travelers are treated to a multi-course gourmet lunch complete with local specialties and plenty, and I do mean plenty, of wine. And then, even some more wine. We have international passengers from all around the world, so um, the cellar door managers, their wine lists are growing, their mailing lists are growing to international passengers. Um, a lot of wines, as you know, it, from Australia, the export market is just huge at the moment. Um, so any exposure that they can get into the international markets, the wineries really appreciate. It is the kind of trip that makes a lasting impression. Scenery that pleases the eye, wines that please the taste buds. And so, perhaps, more to take home than just a few bottles of the local product. Everything. Memories of the Barossa Valley, the whole area. Uh, a true experience of South Australia. Of course, sampling the great wine and some of our great food that is available in the Barossa. And generally just a very good day that they can talk about for the rest of their lives. During a time when vacations can seem as busy and harried as your job, why not take a little time to hop on a train, see the sights, to stop and smell the wine? Yeah, why not? Day in the Barossa and wine tasting, laid back, easy, easy trip up. Don't have to drive a car, why not? It's an easy choice, and one where your love of wine 
and your love of trains roll happily along together here in Australia. From 1903 until 1932, Kenosha, Wisconsin's transit system was entirely based on electric streetcars. There were steel wheels on steel rails. There were two bells on the foot gong. Like elsewhere, though, the streetcar gave way to the trackless trolley, which in turn was bumped into history by the diesel bus. But what goes around comes around, and in Kenosha, the electric streetcar is once again coming around every few minutes. Located between Chicago, Illinois and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Kenosha area is a growing community where new developments are popping up everywhere. New growth planned for old abandoned industrial sites. Now the electric streetcar is rolled out of the history books and onto Kenosha streets. And it is the electric streetcar which will help pull Kenosha into the 21st century. Well, streetcars are the ideal way to travel because people ride because they want to. With buses, I'm afraid to say, and I'm on the Transit Commission, people ride because they have to. We get people who enjoy riding public transportation when it's on rail. If this route was covered by a bus, you wouldn't see that kind of success. It's fun to ride. The streetcar system is definitely an asset uh, to the community. It provides another unique um, aspect to Kenosha, which is different, differentiates us from other cities up and down the uh, Lake Michigan uh, shoreline. The system uses historic refurbished cars to connect new development with old and to connect the future with the past. They run on a two-mile track, reminiscent of Kenosha's original streetcar track. Built in the 1950s, the cars were purchased from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Each of the five cars is painted in a color scheme to honor cities that had similar systems decades ago. Streetcars are wonderful because they're economical to run. There's very little to go wrong. There's no cooling system, no hydraulics, no air compressors, no steering mechanism. There's no tie rod ends, shock absorbers, that sort of thing. It's very basic, and these cars are good for multi-millions of miles. They probably have them on already. You can see they're very sturdy vehicles. They last indefinitely. We call this intermodal because we're connecting commuter rail with light rail, with motor bus and taxi and interurban bus. We have five modes of transit in Kenosha. Kenosha is very transit minded. These historic cars are bringing back old memories and making new ones, especially for Dick Lindgren. Now in his 90s, Lindgren, like the streetcars, are from a simpler time. He was a motorman for the old Kenosha electric streetcar system right up until its end in the 1930s. You don't know people as well as you used to because uh, we knew all the store people, the big stores downtown, and almost everybody went downtown to do their shopping, uh, their serious shopping. You're not, we used to go to the corner grocery store and a uh, milkman came with a horse and uh, wagon to deliver milk and they used to deliver ice the same way. But the, uh, when you were on the streetcar from day to day and you were working and meeting these people, you had more interest in them and their lives and what they were doing. I come down here um, about, uh, or at least once or twice a week, just to watch the streetcar go around the track. Sometimes I get on and ride, and most of the time though, I just uh, come down to watch the uh, uh, streetcars run up and down the track and just get a thrill out of watching them. With the undercar rumble and the overhead wires, they're emission-free billboards for modern mass transportation. By the way, Toronto was only willing to give up these cars because their system has proven to be so incredibly popular that they needed to buy even bigger streetcars. Thanks for being with us and please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead. Tracks Ahead, brought to you by Kambach Publishing Company, bringing you Model Railroader magazine every month for over 65 years. And Classic Toy Trains, the magazine for operators and collectors of toy trains from yesteryear and today. Kato, manufacturer of precision railroad models and the Unitrack system. 
Walther's, manufacturer and supplier of model railroading products serving the hobby since 1932. The Model Railroad Industry Association, a not-for-profit trade group for professionals in manufacturing, importing, packaging, or publishing model railroad merchandise. Markland Trains, a manufacturer of both European and American electric trains.